Just that. Oh my God. For real. Yeah. Jerry. Can let everybody see you. Check your pants. Make sure you got the right ones, please. Three's pressing to see that you may be seated. Uh, state, call your next witness. The state of Florida will arrest you, Your Honor. Okay, the state has rested. <coughs> do you have any witnesses? I do, Your Honor. I'd like to call a teacher of whites. Uh, you got the witness, huh? Yeah, Lee. All right, Ms. White, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I need you to uh, probably turn your volume up if you can on your microphone. Okay. Is the volume up as high as the volume? Yeah. Well, the, the problem with it is that it might pick up your faces. Oh, yes. Uh, this that screen is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah this doesn't have a camera. Oh, oh, that's right. It's over here. Yeah, right. Okay. okay, you need more towards you. Just look that way. Oh, out. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't want to unplug it. <laughs> Good. Yes, thank you. Okay. Miss White, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Miss White, if you'll raise your right hand and be sworn. <laughs> Yes. Okay, and for the record, the camera does pick up the defendant, so uh, you may proceed. Uh, Mr. Che. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ms. White. Uh, would you uh, tell the court what your uh, current title and position is with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? Yes, I am a senior crime laboratory analyst uh, and technical leader assigned to the document examination section here in Pensacola. Um, how long have you been with FDLE uh, in examining uh, documents or evidence that was submitted on behalf of the state? I have been with FDLE for uh, 23 years uh, this year, and I have been in the document examination section since 2007 uh, here in Pensacola, and before that, I was in the Layton Print Footwear and Tire Impression uh, section uh, from uh, 2007, uh, actually from 1999 to 2007. In uh, that regard, uh, what kind of training or uh, what kind of training had you had prior to that to analyze tire imprints? Uh, before uh, uh, conducting casework, in footwear and tire impression analysis. I completed a training program with the FDLE uh, that was uh, in two phases. Uh, the first phase consisted of uh, reading literature, uh, studying the examination processes of footwear and tire impressions. Uh, and the second phase consisted of supervised casework under the direct supervision of another qualified analyst in the section. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, supervised casework portion, uh, we uh, underwent a, a uh, mock trial uh, portion and I successfully completed uh, the entire program and was then released to work uh, cases on the bench. Uh, going back to uh, August of 2006, uh, where was your office located, the FDLE office that you were doing your analysis in? In 2006, I was located at the uh, Jacksonville office. Did there come a time that you were given uh, a couple of items of evidence, one being a, a tire impression that was a mold? Do you recall that? A tire, uh, a tire impression uh, if you are referring to tire casts? Yes. Yes. 
And in addition, were you also given a live and real tire or a couple of tires? Uh, yes, uh, uh, original tires were submitted in the, in the cases. And did you uh, uh, analyze and review the similarity uh, to identify whether the tire mold was identical to the physical tire that you had in your possession? Yes, I did compare the uh, original tire submitted to the uh, tire cast that were submitted, that were in question. Are you familiar with uh, what case that was involved in? With, was that under FDLE number 2006-05-00765? Yes. Having to do with the victim, Julie Green? Yes, sir. And after having performed your analysis, of, uh, what conclusion did you come up with as to whether the tire, physical tire, matched the uh, mold? Uh, after my comparison, I was able to determine that the one of the tire impressions uh, present on Exhibit Q17 was made by uh, the Exhibit uh, uh, 15, which is uh, one of the tires, the Continental Touring Contact tires um, that was submitted for comparison. Okay. And um, we'd like to go back over that, if I will, for a moment to be sure we're identifying the same tires. Uh, you had received two casts under Q17, and you had also received two Continental Touring Contrast AS tires, not on the rim, under uh, 15 and 16. And this is correct that you have just testified that you found the exact match between uh, Q17 and Exhibit 15 of the FDLE, which was the Continental Touring Tire obtained from your Pullet uh, Junkyard. Yes, that is correct. I, I, don't, I do not know where the tire was collected from. Uh, but yes, the tire, the tire continental flooring contact AS tire, exhibit 15. And then that is well, the tire that I was referring to. Yes, ma'am. And then as far as the uh, second tire, uh, did you do any further work on that? I did not. And for what reason? Uh, once I uh, established that there was an identification uh, with one of the tires, and there were no further examinations of uh, any of the uh, tire questions. Okay. Did you, uh, in your work, uh, do any, uh, take any photographs of the tire? Yes, I did. Okay. And they were in your FDLE file? Yes. I have no other questions. Thank you. Any cross-examination? Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, Ms. White. How you doing? Good afternoon. Doing so, well. Good to hear. Um, were you sent uh, two other uh, cast moldings, you know, or tire casts from case number 2006 Zero 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 one three. Yes. And and were those related to uh, a uh, I want a patent? Is that the name you have related to them? Yes. So you actually had four tire uh, casts to actually work with. Is that correct, ma'am? That's correct. Uh, isn't it true that the uh, tire casts from I want a patent, the uh, I believe it's Q nine and Q ten, that those were not the same as the tire that you identified from Julie Green. That's correct. Those casts were not the same. In, in fact, you were able to determine that it was a completely different tire, correct? Yes, and actually one of the casts was of a shoe impression. Yes, sir. So, uh, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. So, and the tire that you were able to determine initially from Julie Green was a Continental, is that correct? That's correct. 
And then the tire from uh, Miss Patton's scene was, is that a Firestone Affinity? Yes, that's correct. And, and were you able to make a determination of a Firestone Affinity, the LH30 tire that was from Miss Patton's case, comparing that to the Continental tire from Miss Green, were you able to establish that those were on completely different vehicles and they wouldn't be on the same type of vehicle? That's correct. They're two different tires. Ma'am, also just a follow-up. There's no way for anyone, especially you as an expert, to tell how long ago a tire impression was made, correct? That's correct. So, for example, you couldn't hear, testify here today that the tire impressions that you looked at were actually made at the time of the murder of Miss Green, could you? I cannot. In fact, a tire impression can be from a day, two days, five days, eight days, two weeks, a month. Couldn't it be left at any of those times, ma'am? That's correct. That's possible. May I have just a moment, Judge? Yes. No further questions, Judge. All right, thank you. Any additional questions? Oh, yes, sir, Your Honor. I do have to clarify a couple of matters. In your evaluation of Q17, the tire involved with the Julie Green case, uh, did you uh, make, give any detailed comments as to how you arrived at the match? Uh, as to specific criteria? Well, uh, in my report, uh, I referred to uh, the not only the track design, but also the size, shape, as well as the noise treatment and individual characteristics. And those were all uh, in, in combination with each other that led to the identification of the 15 to the uh, cast to the tire impression on the exhibit Q70. Okay. So understanding your answer that to specific criteria in the impression was within the thread design, is that correct? Yes, sir, it included the thread design. And the size, size I'm sorry, the size and shape? As yes, well as, sir. And what is noise treatment? So the noise treatment is a part of the thread design. Uh, so is the noise treatment includes uh, the varying sizes of the elements that are on the tire. Uh, and uh, the variation of those elements uh, not only make up the design, but they help uh, uh, treat the noise that the tire emits uh, when the tire is in contact with the, with the road. And I understood your, your last uh, question here was evaluation of the tire track located uh, under the Iwana Pat case, and you found those to be two different tires. Does that yes, I know that those. I'm sorry, I cut you off. I, I cut you off. I apologize. Um, can you can uh, you going back to the question. question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the tire track located under the Iwana Pat case, and you found those to be two different tires. Yes, I know that those. I'm sorry, I cut you off. I apologize. Can you going back to the question? Yes, ma'am. When you evaluated the tire molder prints that was received in the Iwana Patton case, you determined that they were. From two different tire designs, and therefore not matching to a, a, a similar automobile that would have had those tires on it. Yes, I in, in the uh, I want a patent case. I concluded that the pre design when I researched the pre design, it was uh, reflected as a Firestone Affinity LH30 or any other tire with the same or similar track design. And that is not the same as a continental uh, contact story. Thank you, Dan. Okay, anything else? No, sir. Not for Ms. Witness, Sean. Thank you. Huh? Not for Ms. Witness, Sean. Okay, uh, thank you, ma'am. Oh. Uh, you'll be excused at this time. I'm sorry, hold on.
just to clarify a, a small issue, Your Honor, my uh, Mr. Hayes has given me a question that I think is appropriate. Going back to the original tire of the 217, uh, you concluded, did you conclude what kind of a model car that uh, they, they would generally be as, uh, be running under? Uh, I believe, I think it was a report uh, for, for in investigative purposes. I, include, I included a copy of the contact of the continental contact story tire, and I think it did list some possible uh, 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 vehicles that the tire uh, is, was used on. And what were the vehicles? And, I'm sorry, can you name those vehicles? Uh, and, and they were listed as the original equipment, uh, and that basically means that uh, when those cars or uh, were manufacturers. Uh, the manufacturers included that tire as original equipment on the vehicle. Uh, and those particular cars were, were brands, I should say, uh, were Chevrolet, Toyota, Ford, Nissan, Mercury, GM, and Buick. Okay, and that they are not SUVs, they're regular car vehicles? Uh, well, this particular tire is a passenger tire. Passenger? So passenger. And yes, sir. What was the condition of the tire? Did it appear to be, what condition was it in as far as uh, uh, the road tread itself? Did it appear, what, you tell me what, what your impression was as to the age of the tire or its use at that point you received it. Well, I did not, I, 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 I'm not able to uh, uh, discuss age, uh, but the tire did have wear on it, uh, and enough wear uh, that that was also uh, included in combination with the other characteristics that were present there uh, that led me to the identification. Uh, so your, your answer on that was that there was adequate wear that match the impression that was found in the, uh, in the mud at the Julie Green case. Oh, you yeah. don't know where it came from. Oh, I, I don't, but, I have no idea where it came from. But it matched the impression of the mold that you're not seeing. Yes. Okay. Now, on the, on the patent case, uh, did you correlate any type of a vehicle that that tire would have uh, left that impression? I did not. But you only determined that they were not similar. Yes, they're two different tires: the Continental Touring Contact and the uh, Firestone Affinity LH30 are two different tires. Okay. The third tire would be totally different. Yes, ma'am. Now, uh, again, you received these. Um, Did you ever actually show when you received uh, both all of this evidence to evaluate approximate date? What was the approximate date that you received, or the date that you received the uh, tire impression on the Julie Green case? Are you referring to the tire cast? Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, approximate date. Uh, I can tell you when the tasks were submitted to uh, the Jacksonville Laboratory. Uh, they were submitted, received in our evidence section is the Jacksonville Laboratory, June 21st, 2006. And when were the uh, tires from the uh, uh, Miss Patton's case? Submit the entire mold submitted from the patent case. Uh, let's see, I'm referring to my notes. Uh, the entire cast in that case were submitted to the Jacksonville Laboratory 
June 21st, 2006. Thank you very much. Anything else? No, Judge, nothing at all. Council, anything else? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. You are excused at this time, okay? Thank you, sir. All right, uh, your next witness, please. I would call uh, uh, Julie Zubilla. Dr. Julie Zubilla. I'm sorry, no. Dr. Candy Zubilla. Hi, uh, this is Judge Zambrano. Can you hear me? I can. All right, if you'll raise your right hand and uh, be sworn at this time. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you out? I do. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Uh, Shea? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Can you have one Good morning, Doctor. Um, I, I have, um, I'd li like you to uh, give us some background as to your education, your experience, and so forth. If you can uh, start with your education. If we can go back and just have her state her name for the record and spell it out, please. Okay. Yeah. Please state your name for the record and, if you will, spell it. Yes, it's Candy Zulegger, C A N D Y Z U L E G E R. And where are you currently employed? With Trendy DNA Solutions. I'm a consultant for them. How long have uh, you been a consultant with them? Uh, well, when the lab started in 2004, I did consulting services then, um, as well as DNA testing, but since 2018, I've been doing exclusive. Uh, consulting work. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about your education, if you will. I have a bachelor's degree in biology, a master of science degree in cellular and molecular biology. Um, I completed a thesis with that. I started with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement back in 1996. I worked there until 2004. In 2004, I started Trinity DNA Solutions where I was a laboratory manager and the technical leader um, until 2018 when it was sold. And I still do consulting work under that same uh, name, Trinity DNA Solutions. Uh, but I work for FDLE as a forensic DNA analyst and the same thing in Trinity DNA Solutions. So I would say about a total of 25 years experience, uh, 23 on the bench. Uh, have you uh, published any documents, any papers or anything about DNA? Well, the, publish, the publishing that I did was back when I did my master's research. Um, it was on oil spill biosyntactic production, so it wasn't related to this type of forensic work. Okay. And uh, along that line, uh, have you obtain knowledge about uh, DNA and, and uh, the testing of semen? Yes, like I said, I started my forensic DNA career with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. I completed a year-long training course with them, um, most of which would involve uh, the identification of semen and spermatozoa and the microscopic analysis of that, of that along with the DNA testing that I did. Um, I continued those skills and Owning those skills with Trinity DNA Solutions when I went to a private lab. Can you give a estimated number of evaluations you may have done uh, evaluating for DNA and semen? An approximate number. Possibly total number of samples, uh, 5,000, 10,000. Would it be correct to say you have many years of experience 
in evaluating both the DNA uh, and also semen? Absolutely. And in fact, at, when I was at Trinity DNA, if there was a, a problem with a sample, with a sample that contains sperm, um, I would go in and troubleshoot it, uh, either re-extract it or do microscopic analysis in order to get that sample to work correctly. So yes, that, that was basically my forte. And uh, going back on, uh, on evaluating uh, both DNA and semen, are there any official uh, publications that you have reviewed, and in particular about the life of, of these substances remaining on the body, whether in the oral cavity or in the mouth, on or, and how long they would be there uh, when a person becomes deceased? Yes, um, for this case, I noticed that um, it seemed to be of particular interest um, to determine the how long the semen would persist in the oral cavity. So I did an extra review of that um, in order to try to give the jury some additional information. Uh, what? Uh, where did you go for that source? Or what uh, was the source of the information on the life of half life of semen? Um, well, it was not just one single source because you're gonna depending on who does the publication and the methods that they use, um, you're going to get a little bit different answer. So um, I was just able to look up uh, some of the different references and different journals. Um, they give the length of time um, that it seems going to persist in live individuals, because that's the majority of what's going to be published or what um, are living individuals. And uh, as a result of that review, uh, were there any special conditions or any conditions that uh, would affect the life of, uh, let's say, sperm in, that's been detected in someone's mouth? Uh, definitely. Well, the, the nature of the mouth is that saliva is always being produced, um, so that's going to uh, remove any of the uh, DNA or semen that might be in that cavity, and that's why it seems to disappear. Um, it does disappear more quickly than it would in a, a vaginal cavity. Um, so, if you ask me off, I, I believe in my, my testimony, I said it should persist about 24 hours, and that is about what I found. Um, but some are shorter than that, and some are longer than that. Uh, is there any special well, in, in coming up with those uh, times, uh, I want to be sure we're talking about the same time. So if you're indicating that in the uh, mouth of a living person, that DNA could exist there for 24 hours or longer, is that your answer? Yes, anywhere from six hours to um, I think one went up to, one had a sample work at 48 hours, where the maximum amount of times that they could detect semen. And a live victim. I only found one reference in, um, to a deceased victim, and that was in 1975, and that was three to four months. Uh, that was in a deceased person at the... The DNA, and it was was that oral or was that uh, some other body test? No, all this is for oral cavity. So, uh, tell us about what what information was present on going back for months uh, back by the one that went, that you just asked about. Um, I don't know specifically. Obviously, it was a medical examiner that was able to determine this from a, a deceased individual. Um, the, obviously, they had to do a calculation as to time of death, and they were also able to uh, determine there was spermatozoa in that sample as well. Is there any way to correlate the existence of DNA that is located in some uh, DNA or semen located in someone's mouth to the exact time of their death? An exact time, no. 
And the entire problem with that is you're taking an estimate as to the time of death, and you're multiplying that times or adding the estimate as to when that semen was deposited. So that leaves a very large margin of error. So to find an exact amount of time, I don't believe you can. Thank you. No other questions. Any cross-examination? Yes, Judge. Good afternoon, Ms. Zulgar. Good afternoon. Ms. Zulgar, at the beginning of your testimony, uh, Mr. Shea referred to you a couple times as, as doctor. You're not a, a medical doctor, are you? I, I do not have a PhD or an MD, no. I have a master's degree. Yes, ma'am. And. Do you remember me taking your deposition back in January of this past, well, not this past year, 20, 2022? Correct. Uh, at that time, you said you had worked approximately 100 hours on this case. Is that accurate from back then? Yes, it would be more than that now, yes. Well, how many hours have you worked now since that time on this case? Probably another 20 hours. So another 20 hours, so up to about 120 hours? Right. And how much is your hourly rate for the defense team in this case? It's 200 an hour. So I'm, an, I'm an attorney, I'm not very good at math, but about 24,000 total? Um, that sounds about right, I can check it for you. Yeah. And in that deposition, we talked a little bit about your consulting work you've done since 2018. Um, isn't it true that you have not testified for a state attorney's office in your capacity as a consultant? As a consultant, no. Uh, the majority of my testimony prior to 18 would be for uh, prosecutors of state attorney's offices or uh, Department of Public Prosecutions in Bermuda. Um, but since I only do consulting, uh, the only attorneys that I've been working for are either public defenders or private defense attorneys. And again, that's over the last four years, give or take. Correct. And you haven't been with FDLE since 2004. Correct. And I want to ask you a little bit about the research you did regarding, Mr. Shea said, the half-life of sperm in the mouth. Was that, were those articles that you researched, were they peer-reviewed articles? Yes. And can you they were published in Journal of Forensic Sciences, that sort of thing. Can you tell me those articles and when they're from? What journals? Um, I didn't record the journal names, but I can find that for you. Um, one was Willett et al. in 1986 was 13 hours. Um, Allard et al. in 1982 was 6 hours. Allard et al. in 1997 was 28 to 31 hours. Nittis, N-I-T-T-I-S, et al., 2016, 12 to 24 hours. Casey et al., 2017, 15 hours, and one sample was at 48 hours. Fenelop et al., F-O-N-N-E-L-O-P, 2019 was 12 hours. And then there's one, Willett et al., W-I-L-L-O-T-T, -T, is a 1945 reference, and that's three to four months. And that's on a deceased, that's the only one I can find on a deceased victim. On a deceased victim. Correct. And, and the one you mentioned, 48 hours, you said that was on one person included in the study? Yes. Are you familiar with, you mentioned the 1982 study by Mr. Allard, J.E. Allard, that was also with Willett as well, correct? Um, I'm not sure that's all I recorded was um, just one of the names on there to try to make it in a, a little table. Uh, an article published in the Forensic Science International 1982. Does that sound accurate? That sounds accurate, yes. Where in that article they concluded that the maximum time is six hours, nine hours if it's on the lips? Correct. And are you familiar with the peer-reviewed article that was published in Scientific World Junior, June Journal, sorry, in 2015? 
which concluded that semen is rarely present on oral swabs after six hours? Um, I don't specifically have that reference, um, but that's generally what I've been seeing, yes. So you've generally, generally been seeing six hours as the longest time? I have seen that on, on this alert at all. 1982 says six hours is the maximum. I've seen a range of those times given. And you would agree that the, the longer time a foreign substance is in a person's oral cavity, the less the, or the less strong and more complete DNA you'll be able to recover. Is that fair to say? Correct. You won't, the longer the time goes by, the less uh, you'll get, the DNA will get degraded and you won't get a full DNA profile. Correct. So obviously, if you collected something after two hours, you'd expect to get a more complete foreign profile than if you recovered it, as you're saying, 10 or 12 hours later. Correct. So the more data, the sooner it's collected. Um, it, it depends on how much is deposited um, in the beginning. But generally speaking, yes, the closer to the time of deposition, you're going to get a full profile. And you, you'd agree that you mentioned a few of the normal functions of the mouth, such as saliva. Would eating and drinking affect how long the DNA stays in your mouth? Right. Any brushing teeth, things like, things like that, yes. What about spitting the foreign substance out? Could that impact how long it can be recovered? Absolutely. May I have one moment, Harold? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Leader. I have no further questions for you. All right, thank you. Anything else? Yes, Your Honor. You were asked by the uh, state uh, what your hourly rate is and the time that you had spent on this case. Uh, are you paid by the state of Florida or by the def defendants? I'm still paid by the state of Florida. Yeah. Stand by. Proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, when did you first uh, become involved in this case? Oh, goodness, I know. It was sometime in 2020, I believe. I received the uh, the case file in August of 2020. Now, in receiving the uh, case file, uh, can you um, describe how much work, what work you performed since that date? Can you kind of give us a chronological uh, layout? Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be specific, but the volume of work that you perform between uh, 2020 and up through the current time? Um, well, there were three different case files I reviewed. Um, I know one had over a little over a thousand pages, another one had 
um, I want to say maybe 500, 500 pages, so well over 2,000 pages, and that doesn't include um, additional data I had to look at. There was um, there's the review of all that information, pulling different references, um, then there were the uh, depositions that everybody gave. So I had to review all of those different items as well and compare it to um, the case file to ensure that there were discrepancies and stuff uh, between those things. And again, going back and even more recently pulling all the different references on um, the persistence of semen, is what I've spent several hours you know, trying to compile all that information. Uh, well, let's go back to the other evaluations and work that you did in reference to the 1,500 pages and so forth. Uh, what was contained in those pages that you did an evaluation on, uh, if you will? So what's contained in a, um, a case file is the, the, the DNA report, the uh, case tracking forms, um, on any of the evidence that was submitted in the case, the uh, any evidence, the notes on the actual evidence, any photographs taken of the evidence. Um, then there is the they'll come up, they'll have the they'll log the their specific numbers that the samples go through the process where they're tracked. So those numbers are reported, and the samples get tracked that way through the whole DNA testing system. So then there's um, DNA extraction pages, there's DNA quantitation pages, there's uh, DNA amplification pages, there's um, the final profile analysis, uh, there's the electropharograms, which are the printed pages, the color, color pages of the actual DNA types, there's statistical pages as to when these statistics were performed, as to how frequently a profile would occur in a population. So it's, it's goes through basically the whole process. Um, I'm able to review what the uh, the state used to generate their conclusions as well. And that was included in the bench notes that you received from each of the FDLE DNA analysts who performed a particular function on a particular report? Correct. And. Um, What is the uh, standard hourly pay for an experienced person like yourself who undertakes this evaluation of FDLE or, or DNA uh, results? What, what is the average uh, payment for that? Professional um, payment. Well, I charge 365 an hour if it's private pay. Which now, is obviously more than the 200. Now, suppose it is not private pay. How much do you charge? 200 an hour. In this particular case, was this uh, the fee that you charged was the fee for uh, other than private pay, correct? Correct. And so this is a lower fee that's normally paid for someone performing the services that you have performed. Uh, if it was, the defendant wants to talk to Mr. Shea. Okay. Okay.
have no other questions. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, Judge. Ms. Sulier, you were you were a defense witness, correct? I am, yes. And you were hired by Mr. Shea and the defense team in this case, correct? Correct. I have no further questions, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Uh, yes. I have no uh, further questions. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, ma'am. Uh, you'll be uh, released at this time. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, you have another um, matter to attend to. I'm sorry uh, that you wanted to take care of at this time. Wait, do you, you uh, Yes, sir. Okay, and this is pursuant to stipulation, correct? Yes, Your Honor, it is. Okay, uh, Mr. Shea is going to read an answer into the record, and this is by stipulation uh, admitted as a fact. Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, on July 29th, 2020, uh, Thomas Youngman, the uh, uh, evidence uh, detective evidence technician who collected evidence at the uh, Julie Green homicide location, was asked a question about why he uh, collected the tire mark impressions that were left at the Julie Green homicide. And upon asking him that question, his answer was per per verbatim. There was some fresh tire marks. There was, well, the roadways were in comma, but no homes were being built there yet. And there was a dirt road that went out towards LPGA to the east. And there were some tire tracks that looked like somebody sped up pretty quick, period. I was able to photograph them. I took an impression of them. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like for you to do is, this is going to be, a, I hate to do this to you, but you're going to have to go back to the jury room for just a few minutes, then I'll call you right back, okay? It's off. Okay. All right, uh, the jury has left the, uh, the courtroom. Can you take a peek, make sure they're not in that room or close that door for me, please? Yes. Thank you. Uh, at this time, according to what I've written down, uh, the state has exhausted the witnesses that you told me you were going to call. I don't see anybody else on the list. Before I ask you whether or not you, you're going to rest, I'd like to address your client. Uh, Mr. Hayes, it sounds to me like the case is coming to a conclusion, and this is the time that you'll have the opportunity to, uh, you have to make a decision whether or not you'd like to testify or you don't want to testify. Uh, as you heard me say during jury selection, um, I, I have asked the jurors to respect whatever decision you make. But the decision has to be made by you and not by your lawyers. Now, there's some advantages and disadvantages to testifying uh, or not testifying. You know, if you do testify, you'll get to tell the jurors, you know, what you want to say. But the danger is that you'll be vigorously cross-examined by the state uh, with respect to any matter that you testify to or that it relates to the case itself. If you don't testify, obviously, you, the jury doesn't get to hear what you have to say, but you don't get cross-examined, and that may be a valuable thing. Uh, if you do testify, you may be, like I said, forced to, to answer questions you don't want to answer, and those things could be very damning. 
If you do testify, you'll be treated as if you were any other witness in this case. That means that you'll get a direct examination, and then you'll be cross-examined. Um, did you have an opportunity to talk with your lawyers about whether or not you'd like to testify or not testify? Um, I have discussed with him, and we decided that I will not testify. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
This one be short. Yeah, we, we work on Monday. So okay. We are, we're coming on Monday and we're going to do closing. Closing is Monday. I'm going to leave the yours the option of choosing. Uh, we need to raise I'm, I'm going to make the call. I'm going to have them come in, say, at 10. Is there some that come from the land? Give them a little bit of time. We'll go through closing, which include the lunch hour. Um, and then uh, once you're done with closings on Monday, uh, jury deliberations on Tuesday. Now, Judge, your, your policy, do you instruct them before jury instruction? Uh, jury no. uh, closings are after. After. Yes, sir. After. So they'll be instructed Tuesday morning. Correct. And I don't want anybody reading the jury instructions to them. I don't mind you talking about them. I don't mind you showing some things about them, but I don't want you to just read the whole thing to them. Okay? So you want us, I know you're going to have the jurors come and take you. want us here at 9 o'clock on Monday morning with some lawyers. Yeah, I want you guys here a little bit early. Um, so we don't have the same problem we had today, that there was a bunch of issues that. All at 8 30, your usual time for the lawyers. Ironic that the person who arrives the latest is the one who asks you for an earlier time. I know myself. <laughs> I know myself. That's what they call ironic. Okay. All right. Bring the jury in. Yes, sir. We will continue to work after the jury is excused. You'll need to formally rest in front of the jury, okay? Jerry. Okay, jury's present and seated. You may be seated. Uh, defense called your next witness. Do you have them? Your Honor, the uh, defense is arrested. State, do you have any rebuttal witnesses? No, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, both the state and the defense have rested their cases. That concludes the evidentiary portion of this trial. What remains is the uh, closing arguments and the uh, charging, giving you the law, called jury instructions, and then your deliberations. Because of logistical issues, we really can't get those things started this week. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and adjourn for the day and then give you tomorrow off. Uh, and we will be returning back to court on Monday at, say, uh, 
10 a.m., Monday at 10 a.m. For uh, that time will be the closing arguments. It's anticipated that closing arguments will take uh, roughly anywhere between uh, two and four hours. So after the closing arguments, I will be sending you back home and then have you come back on Tuesday for jury uh, de deliberations. I'll read you the law on Tuesday and then deliberations. By law, I have to sequester you on Tuesday. That means when you come in on Tuesday, I'm going to ask every one of you to bring an overnight bag, <laughs> just in case. I'm not saying that I'm going to take, take you in and sequester you. That's only if we don't have a verdict. If we have a verdict, then that's fine. But if we don't have a verdict and you get tired of deliberating uh, on Tuesday, then I would have to sequester you and then have you resume deliberations on West Wednesday. So you might want to let your, your significant other, whoever it is, uh, that uh, starting on Tuesday, you're going to be at the mercy of the court. We will provide your meals. We will do all those things. If you have medication that you have to take, you know, bring some with you so that uh, that doesn't become an issue. Um, that's the plan uh, for now. We don't plan beyond that at this point in time until we have a verdict in this case. I just remember what I said back in jury selection. I could have sequestered you from the very first day until today. And I haven't done that just because I trust that you will not do any investigation on your own, that you will not talk to anyone about this case, that you will not try to uh, find out any information independent of what you've heard in the courtroom. And that includes, you know, Googling, tweeting, Instagram, TikTok, I don't know all those things, you know, MySpace, Facebook. You don't do any, you don't do any of, I know, I'm an old timer. Uh, uh, you don't do any of those things, you know, don't look any encyclopedia, don't look up any words, maps, names of the people involved, witnesses involved, the victims. You don't look, look up anything at all. I mean, what you've heard is the evidence, and that evidence is the only thing that should be considered by you. Uh, and not something that independently you may have come across. So please, please abide by the rules. We want this to be a, a lawful verdict and can only be a lawful verdict if you follow the rules. So once again, I want to remind you of that instruction and I'll continue to do that throughout the trial. Um, like I said, on Tuesday, on Monday, you'll have additional instructions. We will have you park in separate areas of the parking lot, uh, grouped together and the bailiffs will set aside an area for you guys to park together. And that's just part of our procedures. Um, do you all have any questions before I release you until Monday at 10 a.m.? Yeah. The parking, that would be on the Tuesday parking. That's correct, on Tuesday, yeah. Yeah, so just to safeguard your vehicles if in case uh, you have to be uh, sequestered. Yeah. So there's, there's obviously four alternates, right? Say it again. There's four alternates. Do, do there are, and I'll let you know on... Uh, on, on Tuesday, I'll let you know who the four alternates are. And there's a, there's a procedure to be followed. Okay. I'll let you know on Tuesday. Okay. So, yeah. Will we um, still want to take notes for closing arguments? Yes, well? yes. You will keep your notepads. You'll be able to take notes. The only thing that you will not have to take notes on is the jury instruction because each of you will get your own independent package of jury instructions. So. So each of you will have those uh, those with you. Now, uh, I'll, I'll give you additional instructions next week. That's, that is the plan as far as scheduling. Um, I'm going to release you at this time. Enjoy the great American race on Sunday. Uh, it's something we are famous for locally, and uh, we'll see you on Monday at 10 a.m., okay? For them. For us, it'll be earlier. Yes, sir. Okay. Guys, hold up. Hold up. And leave your notepads face down, please. Witness is off. Yeah. Have a good weekend. You too, you as well. Thank your wife again. Yes. Oh, yes. All right. They were all gone by the end of the day. <laughs> it was I, ate like, I ate like 10 of them at the end of the day. <laughs> all right. Okay, the jury's out. I'd like to go over the jury instructions. Uh, do you need a break? About a 15-minute break?
Yeah, let's take a 15-minute recess, come back, and then we'll go over some of the jury instructions, okay? Start looking at them. All right, we'll be in recess for 15 minutes.